afternoon, everyone. Welcome to this webinar organized by the Belgian Foreign Trade Agency and its partners, the FPS Foreign Affairs, Flanders Investment and Trade, AOX, and Hub Brussels. It takes place on the occasion of the release of our latest today, the role of uh, logistics service providers in the, in the utilizations of FTAs by exporters. This study gives an insight on how freight forwarders, custom agents, shipping agents, and their peers can help exporters to become even more competitive abroad by assisting them in the utilization of FTAs. We have a charge agenda for the coming hour, but first allow me to quickly just run through a few frequently asked questions. Uh, first of all, the slides of all the speakers will be made available. You receive them via email and find them on our website together with the study. This webinar is recorded and will be uploaded on our website as well. Also, the study of the role of logistics service providers in uh, the utilization of FTAs by exporters will be released immediately after the webinar. This webinar with, will end with a Q&A. In case you have a question for a speaker, you can put it in the Q&A together with the name of the speaker you address it to. In, in case your question won't be covered during the webinar itself, we certainly answer you at a later stage. To kick off the webinar, I'd like to welcome uh, Mrs. Geraldine Amberger, advisor for implementation of EU trade agreements at the DG Trade at the European Commission. She'll open this webinar with remarks on the conclusion uh, and implementation of EU free trade agreement. Mrs. Amberger, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, uh, Mrs. Chalier, uh, for having invited me and thank you very much uh, and good afternoon to ladies and gentlemen. Uh, indeed, the fact that we are here together amongst uh, member states, the Commission on the one hand, but also business representatives and TPOs on the other hand, is very reassuring and is the first sign that we are moving in the right direction, namely partnering up on making the most of free trade agreements. And for whom are we doing this? Obviously for our traders. And uh, when we uh, look at the fact that 93% uh, of all the companies exporting uh, in the EU are currently SMEs, I think this is a very worthy cause. Also, congratulations uh, to Walter de Costa on this new study, which is, uh, in my view, at least um, helping us uh, to piece together uh, the different elements of a puzzle that we are still uh, struggling with, namely how to reach uh, more benefits, how to reach more potential beneficiaries of the trade agreements that we negotiate uh, for the EU. And um, so the service that negotiates these agreements for the EU in the European Commission is the one I am working for. Um, just to remind you, we have more than 40 preferential trade agreements in place today with more than 70 partners. And this is the most dense network uh, in the whole world. And uh, we see that these agreements, uh, they have a lot of benefits uh, for companies. On the one hand, obviously, they are securing uh, a framework uh, for companies to trade. Um, it ranges from IPR provisions, uh, subsidies, competition, to trade facilitation and services. Public procurement uh, should not be forgotten. And one central piece of all these agreements is also the liberalization of tariffs, means to the lowering or elimination of customs duties. Now, um, benefits for companies are obvious and quite straightforward. Exporters can benefit from zero tariffs and can be more competitive in comparison to companies from other third countries dealing with the same partner, but they do not come for free. And here is where the matter starts to become a bit more complicated because in order to benefit from these customs uh, due to liberalization from zero tariff, uh, you first have to know about the free trade agreement. You have to understand whether your product is eligible. You have to fulfill the rules of origin and at the same time, and this comes on top, obviously, on your core priorities of most uh, exporters, namely that the product reaches the customers in good time and in good shape. And here is exactly where logistics service providers come in. 
Again, uh, we have not yet had a lot of contacts with logistics service providers. We had a few interviews and obviously we take note of the study, but we've already seen last year in our discussions, notably with Belgium, but also other member states, that this is a door we should be opening um, and a path we should be exploring. Why is that? For the simple reason that customs uh, agents or logistics service providers they reach thousands of clients exporting to different countries all over the world in different sectors. So we have huge economies of scale, but also because in this present moment, we have a situation that could maybe favor the path that includes the uh, logistics service providers, namely a closer cooperation and inclusion of this group of intermediaries into our promotion of FTA benefits. And this is first linked to, as you all know, the entry into force of uh, our trade agreement with the UK on the 1st of January of 2021. And the UK becoming, before Switzerland, our biggest preferential trading partner. And it also means that many companies, um, especially SMEs, who were dealing with the UK in terms of part of the internal market, they have now in front of them a whole set of issues namely uh, there are borders, there are forms to fill in, there is a rules of origin uh, uh, audit uh, to be done. So this is extremely uh, timely. It's on the one hand, it's a problem. On the other hand, it's also an opportunity and there may be more demand uh, for services offered uh, by custom agents and logistics service providers when it comes to FTAs. And then also I'm told in um, some conversations that the business model and the way that logistics service providers see themselves is more moving towards consultants. And that consultancy could then also include, at least that's what we hope, our free trade agreements. Um, to conclude, um, already we have a situation, notably where our free trade agreements are delivering results. We have seen that um, in the years uh, from uh, 2015 to 2020, these agreements have led to a stronger a stronger um, growth in trade than the EU trade with the rest of the world. We also see that Belgium makes good use and Belgian companies make good use of the preferences we negotiate. Namely in 2020, the preference utilization rate of Belgium exports um, came uh, to 72%, which is only 3% lower than the EU average. But uh, more importantly, Belgian companies were able to save 463 million euros thanks to FTAs. On the other hand, it's also true that Belgian companies left on the table 127 million euros in 2020. Now, what is the Commission doing? To conclude, what can we do together? The Commission has set up in 2020 two tools that all of you are many of you may be familiar with. First, a one-stop shop for people who want to complain about obstacles and issues they face in trading with third countries. And secondly, the access to market platform. It's a one-stop shop platform where companies can find all the information they need, both on importing into the EU and exporting to more than 122 export markets. Now, HOM, as I said, was launched in 2020 and the Belgian as a member state, but also the Belgian TPOs uh, together with ITPOA and many other associations have helped us to promote it. And we have carried out in the first 15 years of its uh, inception, uh, more than uh, 50 events. And we have trained uh, next to the uh, 6,000 uh, people. But um, we're reaching a threshold, uh, reaching a ceiling of what we can usefully do without the help of important intermediaries and important partners, I would say, are obviously the member states in the first place and trade promotion authorities, industry associations, but then also, again, coming back, um, others, uh, notably the um, logistics service providers. So here's a very short message since we have uh, not a lot of time and I want to rather have a good discussion and listen to your comments than uh, take uh, too much time. But so the message is to the Belgian Foreign Trade Agency, please continue investigating this matter. We'll give you a forum to present the results. And we hope that other member states will also start investigating and taking the matter up. Second, to logistics service providers, inform your clients, if you can, um, more systematically 
about uh, the existence of free trade agreements, but also our platforms like E2M, ROSA, the Rules of, self, uh, Rules, um, of Origin Self-Assessment Tool, and other tools that are on the A2M platform. We have already uh, 1.9 million users, but um, we still, as the study shows, can have more and also can, can reach SMEs and companies that we have not yet reached. And while it's impossible for the Commission to train and reach uh, the 600,000 SMEs in the EU, I think exploring cooperation and relying more on customs agents and logistics service providers could go a long way in uh, getting to a better utilization of our free trade agreements. And I think this is what we are all united in, um, in trying uh, and achieving in the, in the future. So I think this is um, my main message today. Again, thank you for inviting me and looking forward uh, to a lively discussion. Thank you. Thank you, Mrs. Amarjé. This was very interesting, and I'm sure they will, uh, this will encourage us to go even more further. Um, now I would like to welcome my colleague, Walter de Coster, International Trade uh, Analyst at the Belgian Foreign Trade Agency, and who was in charge of the study. He'll go through the main finding of the study. Walter, the floor is yours. Thank you, Christelle, for this, for this introduction. Um, let me also start by, by expressing my gratitude to, to both the Commission and Zikir for, for kindly accepting to take the floor today. And more or less like, like Geraldine mentioned, I, I hope that my intervention can be a bridge between their presentations, between their two separate worlds, let's say. Because you know all too well that the theory of, of negotiating free trade agreements on one hand is usually far away from, from the daily realities of exporters on the other hand. Geraldine already mentioned many difficulties that, that exporters face. And many companies, and certainly SMEs, need someone to bring the FTAs close to them to, to make it more accessible. And obviously, trade promotion agencies, such as our partners, FIT, ABEX, and Brussels, they are, they are great for this, also via their role in the Enterprise Europe Network, uh, where they are the, as you may know, the main contact points to help companies like you in using tools, also once more that Chaldine mentioned, such as Access to Markets and ROSA. But complementary, to trade promotion agencies. We also wondered whether uh, logistics service providers, such as freight forwarders, shipping agents, uh, custom agents, whether they can play an important role to make free trade agreements more accessible to exporters like you present here today. We wondered indeed, because it had actually never been measured so far, not in Belgium, not elsewhere, which is yeah, kind of surprising, we, we would say, because, well, as an exporter, as an exporter, you are very likely to already work with your logistics service provider or LSP, as I, I will call it from now on. And this during several steps of your export process, such as, for example, booking cargo space. So we asked ourselves whether LSPs can help exporter to become more competitive. But your presence here today is a testimony that you as an exporter also struggle with the same question. And I guess the message that we want to, want to stay, uh, give today is don't feel guilty, you're not alone with those questions. Stronger even, we did a, a previous study, which is later foundations actually for, for this study. And we found that 80% of the companies in your situation did not know whether they use free trade agreements or not. With, with your situation, I mean, using a, an LSP and being active in markets where FTAs are in place. So this was even more remarkable given the fact that most of those companies are actually thinking that it would be better for them if they would use free trade agreements via their LSP, or they say that they would use free trade agreements if they would not work with an LSP, but do all these expert procedures themselves. And it's this peculiar insight that, that led us to interrogate some experts, and you can see them here on this slide, um, to find for the very, time, very first time answers to questions such as, why are so many exporters that rely on LSPs not aware about free trade agreements, despite their keen interests? To, to use it, what services can LSPs foresee for their clients, and how can we stimulate exporters like you to go to your LSP and to talk about this topic? Let's, uh, let's turn towards the findings now, which I will approach by, by running through the six questions that, that we had when we started out with this, project, uh, with, with this project. And the first question was, are LSPs structurally informing their clients about the existence of free trade agreements. 
And obviously now the answer seems clear that, the, that it is no, because if they all did, this webinar would not take place and, and we would not have such a large audience today. Based on the survey, we found that about 50% of the LSPs are structurally informing long-term clients about free trade agreements. This, this share is slightly lower among ad hoc clients. And our next speaker, Mr. Potilius, will probably go more in depth and will explain that this difference between long-term clients and ad hoc clients depends for a large extent on the possibility to have a so-called uh, onboarding meeting. And this meeting means that your LSP gets to know your, your trade flows, the ins and outs of your products, your suppliers or clients, and all of this will help you or, and, and help your LSP to make the process to prove compliancy much easier. And I know that many of the exporters present here today will say, well, actually, our, the key role of our LSP is just to make sure that our products arrive on time, in good order, and in the right destination. And giving all this additional information will not help us to get these primary tasks um, done. And, and yes, I, I agree with you, but based on the many uh, interviews that we did with, with LSPs, it seems clear that when you export to a country where FTAs are in place, or even if you have a prospect there, take this step and do this onboarding meeting with your LSP. It will streamline your process. And once this happens, you, no, you, you would no longer need to, to trace back eligibility, which is an important word in using free trade agreements. Shelley mentioned the word eligibility already. Um, so you don't, don't need to prove eligibility every single time that you make a shipment to, for example, the UK or to Switzerland. Um, because it, it's all settled then. The only thing left to do if you had this big onboarding meeting is to build in compliancy checks, which is way less uh, time consuming. Okay, so we've established that if you have had an onboarding meeting with your LSP, it becomes more probable that you will be using free trade agreements, which brings me to the second question. Why will you, for example, as an exporter, need to convince your LSP to provide you with this information while other LSPs might structurally inform all of their clients, which is a question that's also important to, to policymakers. And to come directly to the point, it seems that indeed specialization has the most important impact. So the companies that are calling themselves custom agents are way more likely to inform their clients about the, pot the potential gains thanks to free trade agreements. However, it's, it's important to indicate that many well-known faithful waters also call themselves custom agents. So custom agent does not need to be really niche. Uh, our ne the next speaker is, is a representative of the company Ziegler. They are a faithful water, but they're also a custom agent. And it's also the reason why in our study, we use the term logistic service provider rather than either custom agent or faithful water. However, some LSPs indeed, and then mostly the smaller companies, specialized in the sense that they only became pure logistic services uh, providers. Um, so they, they don't find enough staff, for example, to, to work out the, the custom border procedures. And therefore, because they are not capable of, of doing this, they will most probably not inform their clients. So let's indeed assume that you are in a situation as an exporter where you export to countries uh, with which the, the European Union has free trade agreements, uh, but your LSP did not inform you. Then you may ask yourself, well, why is, why is this the case? And in, in our study, we saw three key regions, reasons emerge. Um, and I, I just mentioned the first of them, eh, which is a lack of knowledge among some LSPs. You know as well as I do that utilization of free trade agreements can be very complex. Every free trade agreement is different. Rules of origins can change as, as soon as the HR, HS code changes and, and so on. So an increasing number of, of freightful waters uh, we learned is unable or unwilling to do the constant follow-up. And as a result, they outsource the custom related matters on their turn to specialized custom brokers. So this way, your LSP can continue to deliver your, the, the entire package. So uh, transportation, warehousing solutions, and custom related issues, while they are not 
themselves specialists in the, in the ladder. They just outsource it to a third party. And there's no harm in this as such. But if you would find yourself in this situation, it would be interesting to, to know to notice that they outsource these kind of procedures and to ask your LSP to pass a message that you actually want to speak to the company that they outsource to and let them know that you want them to help you to become more competitive abroad by using free trade agreements. Maybe a, the second reason why you might not be informed about free trade agreements uh, by your LSP, and this is a recurring uh, element, is, is a perceived low sense of urgency. Um, if, if I put it somewhat black and white, your LSP might be thinking that you find it not that important to use free trade agreements. And the reason why they might think so is because maybe you didn't bring it up yet, the issue. Um, and this is more or less a shame because we know that many exporters, maybe not you, 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 the fact that you are present here today knows that you are aware about the existence of free trade agreements, but many of your exporting peers do not. And um, this exactly lack of, of information about free trade agreements leads your leads logistic service providers to believe that you don't care, which is absolutely not the case. It's some kind of catch-22 situation. And I, I hope that this study will try to help us take, um, get, get out of this catch-22 situation where we will try to inform as many exports as possible to, to talk with our LSP, but also vice versa. We want to reach out to LSPs and want to convince them that you are not necessarily not interested but that you simply lack information. And that's the reason why you, didn't, why you did not reach out. And then finally, a third reason to help explain why, why some LSPs do not structurally inform their clients is that they often face a too tight deadline in order to, to leave the time to investigate whether your um, um, application is, is compliant. And in the study, I said the director of logistics in Wallonia uh, who says compliance comes first, speed comes second, and extras such as utilization of free trade agreements only third. Mm, I guess that this echoes what we said earlier on, right? That if you want to circumvent this, this possible prep of, of too many compliance checks, aim for this onboarding meeting with your LSP, streamline the process, and, and once this is done, the, 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 the rhythm will be much higher for your next delivery to the United Kingdom, to Switzerland, to Turkey, or, or whatever. Then a question that is more relevant uh, for policymakers: Are LSPs doing a good job in signing the utilization of free trade agreements? Uh, and then if, if we can go one slide back. Yeah, thank you. So in a nutshell, we learned from the survey that LSPs do inform exporters like you. And if they do, they tend to be successful. With this, I mean that we try to calculate the impact of informing exporters about free trade agreements and LSPs who are actually helping um, their clients to use free trade agreements. And, and there seems to be a correlation indeed between, between both. Then we already arrived to the penultimate question, uh, which is probably also the most important one. How can your LSP help you to use free trade agreements? And thus, how can your LSP help you to become more competitive abroad? It's such an important question that actually the, the next speaker will, uh, will talk uh, during all his presentation about this. Um, but allow me to, to sketch the bigger picture as well. Just to give you an idea, almost half of the LSPs indicate that they can help you identify what monetary advantages the free trade agreement in question can bring to you. So in other words, they know how much money your clients or, or you, uh, their clients, can save and how much more competitive you as a result can become when you use FTAs. There's other LSPs who can provide information on the impact that, uh, that the utilization of free trade agreements might have on, on different divisions of your company, be it procurement, sales administration. Um, some can help build an audit trail, still others can help to, to calculate and determine the value of originating and non-originating content, which is extremely important. And then we saw that about one out of five LSPs in our survey 
uh, indicate that they were not capable or not willing to provide any solutions to their clients. We had seen that these are mainly the smaller LSPs who call themselves the pure logistics providers. However, as, as we mentioned, chances are that they would still deliver the, the whole package, right? But that they would outsource these uh, aspects to others, but they are just not keen to discuss free trade agreements with you because then you would find out that they don't have the expertise and that they de depend on others as well. Um, but the first element on, on this uh, slide is, is maybe the, the most important one, the fact that they simply tell uh, you and other exporting companies that free trade agreements exist. It seems such a basic thing to do, but we still know that many, free, many exporters do not know that free trade agreements exist. So this is already a very, very important step that we can take and is something that we will certainly repeat and repeat when we reach out to LSPs as well. And then a final question uh, that we want to have an answer to in our study. Um, if you, as an exporter, will knock on the door of your LSP, who did not inform you earlier on about free trade agreements, will he be interested to help you? And I'm glad to share the result that, at least based on the survey and, and based on the in-depth interviews that we had, the answer is probably yes. Uh, so we found that Many LSPs who were confronted with, with the finding that exporters like you are eager to use free trade agreements said that this was an interesting signal and, and an encouragement uh, to increase awareness to, to their clients because once more they, they thought that there's lack of interest if there's lack of um, if, if your client or if you didn't tell them about free trade agreements. So this is certainly true for LSPs that are currently almost never helping their exporting clients with free trade agreements. So this might be the case for your LSP if your LSP did not inform you about free trade agreements yet. And also we noticed that the, that the trade and cooperation agreements between the EU and the UK uh, can be a game changer for those kind of companies because this will help them to learn more about free trade agreements since suddenly many more clients are uh, emerged in this topic. All in all, um, I hope that at least with this, with this study, we get the conversation going, that we open the door a little bit in this field. There's still much left to be discussed, uh, much left to be understood and investigated, but, but also with your presence here and with your support, um, I'm, I'm convinced that we will be getting somewhere uh, in the end. On this slide, you, you've, you see some links of organ organizations that might be able to help you in, in using free trade agreements that you can reach out to. So feel free to, uh, to contact them. That was it for, for my uh, turn. Thank you very much for your, uh, for your attention. Thank you, Walter, for the study and for this very interesting presentation and uh, a very unique study too. I'm sure it will help us to become even more competitive abroad. Now I would like to introduce Mr. Dick Potilius, representative of Forward Belgium and head customs and fiscal representation at Ziegler Group Belgium. He will explain us how the logistics service providers can help exporters to become even more successful abroad. Mr. Potilius, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. So I will start uh, my screen. Um, okay. You can see my application. So uh, I'm working for Ziegler as it's been told, but this presentation is given a name of Forward Belgium. Uh, Forward Belgium is, uh, let's, Forward Belgium, um, as you see, the introduction of Forward Belgium is uh, we are, Forward is uh, a service uh, for logic providers, for custom representatives, and for forwarders. Mm -hmm. They are a single point of contact for every relation uh, topic that you have in forwarding and transportation and so ever. However, I know in um, the Flanders, forward is uh, really known. Um, we see in Wallonie, uh, for the moment, it's not really known. So. Uh, this can be an opportunity to let know forward. Uh, they are for everyone 
who is in our business of transportation of logistics. And they uh, have a, a, a real a team uh, that can uh, help you in a lot of issues. So uh, you will see on the slide uh, the members directory and the list of the custom representatives because uh, every real custom representative has an authorization at the Belgium um, customs and it's really important that they are listing in it because sometimes there are people who take uh, your they will do your customs declarations but not under the conditions that the Belgian government exists. So for working with the customs representative uh, in general they're looking for the best transportation combination um, they're preparing the additional formalities, but directly I have to say there are some uh, logistic providers that don't do any customs uh, documents, as there are customs agencies that don't do any transport. So it's up to you to, to look uh, what your um, logistic uh, partner can give you. Uh, you have to know every logistic partner have, has his qualities and his uh, default. So, um, let be sure that you know with who you are working with because it's very important um it's not the topic of the day but uh sometimes proof that you have to give at uh, belgian authorities has to come from your transportation order so the free trade agreement um i was a little bit surprised when motor asked me uh because uh as we speak, we know uh, what free trade agreement is, and uh, sometimes, um, as we have seen before, uh, every uh, customs agent has his own specialities. Um, let me explain. Uh, we have colleagues that do only in the automotive. We have colleagues that only do in vegetables and so so on. But um, luckily, the free trade agreements they take the whole. A picture of all products that you can buy or sell in Belgium. So the free trade agreement, it's not only an import issue, the purchase, but it's also to keep an eye on your exports. We will see later on why it's so important. Because the strength of your competitive position in the prices, for instance, may be in the knowledge of the free trade agreements. Later on, we will see an, uh, an example how uh, the knowledge of a free trade agreement can help you, uh, giving you a position on the market that is really stronger. So, who is your partner in, in this one? It's your logistics service provider or your customs representative, or if you are lucky, uh, your buyer, your sourcing uh, people, because it's not only something that has to be learned by uh, the LSPs, but in my humble opinion, everyone that does sourcing, sourcing, excuse me, uh, that has a, a chief buyer, as we call it, should know this free treat agreement as well. So sourcing, everybody knows the, the new word. Uh, I say, don't just search the cheapest, they do. In a lot of cases, they do. And that's uh, the example I'm, I'm, well, we'll give to you is a real example. So a Belgian firm buys profiles in China. Reason he has sought the offer, he said it's the cheapest in all countries. Is that true or is that false? Well, if you see the import duties from China, it's 12%. The same product from Turkey is 0%. So it's not, it's not only the question what the final cost, but also you have to take in, um, in your calculation the account of the transport costs, the delivery times, and so on. So we see a lot of people, they're buying in China, 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 and then they come to the conclusion uh, it's, it's more expensive. They have to wait longer. We have seen 
as well that the transportation has come from five thousand dollar to eighteen thousand dollar i think it's now uh, so it's really um not so wise to search for the cheapest so there are in the examples uh we have there are duties to pay so that will say the retail excess costs will be higher than the profit margin uh, we all know that companies sometimes have only five to six uh, percent margin and they have uh, 12 percent on the uh, based goods so that's uh, something that can be avoided another consequence and rest assured i can tell you a lot of uh we'll say tricks but it's not tricks it's real uh, regulation uh but that is an example you the goods that you have bought in china uh, you can't sell them to Switzerland because the, uh, these goods are not EU goods. So you have paid the import taxes here in Belgium and you will send them to uh, Switzerland and they will pay again. So it's not hard to see that already you're taking uh, not an advantage in your, in your price. So as I say, the sale price is already higher and the customer has to pay additional taxes on the more expensive one. So your competitiveness is really at risk. Before I take time for the free tree agreements in the various forms, because I should um, mention there are various, various forms. Um, but that will lead us too much because if we want to work with free treat agreements, we have to know the origin of the goods. And if you know the orig origin of goods and you can put them in some matrices that is made by a uh, European uh, Union, then you can have a lot of uh, advantages. And now I will say something that it's really funny for you, I suppose, or it should be funny for you. Uh, if you sell goods from China and you do something with you, well, in some occasions you can send them without any other import duties to Switzerland. That's something that you can ask of that you should ask uh, at a real uh, an LSP who has uh, was really competitive in this uh, matter because it's real difficult matter. So these are these are the real um, the real uh, not so difficult one. So you have a tariff quota. What will say that's the, the meaning of this is uh, the European Union said, uh, for instance, um, beans. Uh, you can take in 200,000 tons of beans without uh, import duties. That is something for your buyer or your sourcer uh, that he has to take uh, in mind. Um, he has to look uh, on and he has to ask to his uh, logic uh, provider or his uh, custom representative in advance. So he has to say, well, I will buy this, one, this product from China, for instance, can you look what the consequences? Because a lot of people look only to the import duties that has to be paid, but there are other duties, as there is, for instance, anti-dumping duties, and they can go really fast. Sometimes they go really fast. So when the goods are arriving here, uh, he pays a lot of more, and he's uh, he's not happy. The tariff suspicion uh, that is when uh, there's a reducing of um, of products that come and the EU needs this product, then they will do a tariff suspicion. Uh, unfortunately, that doesn't count on a uh, lot of um, HS codes, um, harmonized system codes, but sometimes it could it could be uh, a good thing to look further on in the presentation. We will see where you can get if you want. Uh, this information and then you have tariff suspicions with special distinctions um, so that is when non-union goods are released for free circulation 
used in import sectors of the EU, uh, EU economy, as such for shipbuilding or, or planes or so over. So I don't think it's for um, a lot of us, but it's it's the system. So what you have to do, contact your customs representative, no matter what. Maybe he can't answer you, but always he, he, can, he knows somebody who can uh, tell you all about uh, consultancies, um, whatever specialist, even sometimes uh, guys from the customs, uh, they can help, help you with your information. He knows where to search. Um, you will know how to search as well, but he knows where to search. He knows different applications. Uh, you have to know uh, and that's a little bit about uh, uh, outside the free treat agreement, but there are other regimes that can save you money as well. Um, you can take in the goods, you can process the goods and you can re-export them so you don't pay the, the taxes. That's not really an FTA, but it's a gain, a money gainer as well. And so I come to the, the, my last point, he helps you how to learn to discover different regimes with a reduction in costs as a result. We see now, for instance, we see in uh, Brexit uh, times, they send it, the Belgian goods, they send it to the UK, UK do something uh, and send it back. It are uh, uh, EU uh, goods. No, that's a problem because the, the, this formula, this FTA doesn't exist. So you will pay uh, duties on your own products, not good. So there are some things, there are some rules that can help you to not to pay on your own goods. So what's to do? And that is really important what you should do. Determine the commodity codes. It's a very tricky uh, part of the, of the job of the deal, but with the correct commodity codes, you can see what your benefits are. If you have not your correct commodity codes, then you, can, you, you can't uh, go to uh, systems as accumulation or no drawback or any other FTA. Uh, it's very important that you have to do. Ask everybody, ask your, um, your LSP, ask your customs representative, but you have to be sure it's you Take the, the taking the responsibility because it's your product. We as custom um, agents can know everything. We can give you a hint. We can help you. We can help you to search, but we are not got in this matter. We never got so. Um, work with your custom representative to find the most appropriate commodity code, as I explained. And if you have a doubt, then you can uh, apply for a binding tariff information. What is that? Uh, you make a file and you send it to the Belgian customs, and they will set a whole team on it, and they will compare with other countries, and then they will say that it's the only correct HS codes you can use. Sometimes it can be very, very favorable to have this BTE because uh, yeah, don't forget uh, customers, customs, custom officers are uh, human. They can make mistake. And if you have your BTI, then you are sure that you know what you're talking about. So the origin, as I said before, it's very, very, very important because the origins says it all. Without the origins, you can go with a free trade, a free trade agreement. Um, you don't be, be afraid to get to the heart of the matter. What the meaning is this, if you buy to a French company that buys to a um, German company that buys to a Dutch company, uh, and you don't have the proof that the goods are from EU, um, origin, it will you that will take the blame. You will be the last in the chain, it will you who take the blame. Contact your supplier. Have to, he has to give you a supplier's declaration where he confirms that the goods are from EU, otherwise you can have problem. As I said, the last one in the chain determines the tag in the goods 
if they are not union st stages. There are great good rules to which the goods must complain, but do you homework and save money? That's meaning uh, it's not because goods are, uh, for instance, from, uh, and I will not say Russia now, but uh, from the uh, US, uh, US uh, that there are not possibilities to make them uh, EU goods, union goods. Uh, there are a bunch of rules. Um, they are not easy, I said it before, but try to, 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 to look with your uh, partner and you will find something. So we can help you in every application. Uh, we can help you with the register. Before, for instance, if you have an authorization that you can export with a declaration on your um, in invoice, uh, you need a register. We can do that. Uh, we can give you that uh, at once. Because what we have seen in the study of water, but what we have seen in the past, a lot of companies, when we say, why don't you use that? Why don't you try that? Why don't you, why don't you, why don't you? They say, we don't have time. Time is money. I agree, but uh, lost money is also time. So it's really important to know what you're buying and what you're selling. So you can check everything on this link. Uh, I will not expl explain the link because that's not my uh, topic for today. But here you see with the HS code that you see on your left, uh, the country, to what country, there you will see uh, how many rights you have to pay or other measurements that can be uh, given. So that gives you already um, an idea uh, what the client have to pay. If you want to sell DDP, be careful, use access to markets. It's a real good tool and it's, it's a rather simple tool once you know it. This is uh, Rosa, she's a nice, uh, nice uh, lady. She do the rules of origin. As I said before, um, the origin of your goods are very important if you want to play with uh, FTAs. So with this tool, you can go to the rules of origin. Beware, beware. It's extremely difficult. It's extremely depending sometimes of uh, grams or euros of I don't know what, but do the double check and even the triple check before you sign anything uh, that can be used. So um, I see my time is up. Um, unfortunately, uh, I cannot uh, work on the Q and A's because I'm in London and I have to to leave now. But if you send your questions uh, to the um, to Christelle or Walter, uh, we will happy to help you to start. If you want a full assessment of if you want a full um, audit, you always can uh, go to forward and they will guide you through the mean the existing uh, companies that are doing that. But once again, it starts with you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Potidius. All these examples, uh, um, I'm sure, sh uh, showed us how important uh, it's to use this FT. And thank you for your presence today. And we will certainly transfer you the questions. Well, now, thank you to all of you. It's now Q&A time. And we will start with our first question for Mrs. Amberger. Uh, Mrs. Amberger, first questions. Uh, what other action is the Commission taking to make it easier for companies to use FTEs? Yes, thank you very much, um, Christelle. Um, it's a very good question. And indeed, um, so if you don't know about the agreement, you cannot use it and uh, you will not uh, even inquire. So the Commission, obviously, we are um, carrying out uh, continuous events, uh, training on the platform that I mentioned, Access to Markets. Access to markets um, is available 
uh, for all uh, companies in the EU, but also outside the EU, uh, with some limited functions for the latter. But you can actually, as uh, explained earlier um, by the previous speaker, you can put your NACE code and the details of your products, and the system will take you to all the conditions, not only the tariffs, you know, the MFN and the preferential tariffs, but also all the other conditions, including also trade barriers that you may be interested in and other things. And we are continuously training. So we're doing webinars in different EU languages on the A2M. We have carried out, as I mentioned earlier, over 51 events last year and uh, trained over 6,000 uh, participants in uh, these trainings. And on the 28th of April will be the next training. And that one will be also given virtually and carried out um, in English and in cooperation with the Japanese SME um, center. So you can find this information on um, access to market. I will circulate the link where you can be updated on these trainings. And this is one area. Um, in addition, we are also working with member states. Uh, we have regular meetings uh, also with business, uh, also uh, in a sector formation, but also more generally to understand uh, what uh, more can we do. We are participating from the European Commission in events organized by the member states. Uh, we are doing so, for example, again, um, on the 4th and 5th of April, when we will have Market Access Day events in Paris. Uh, and we did so last year um, and the year before with a number of other member states. We are supporting roadshows um, that were carried out in a number of member states. And uh, this is also very interesting um, in order to, to bring the message, actually to bring the FTS to the users, which is what we cannot do in the Brussels bubble. So this is what we do. We are producing, obviously, as I mentioned earlier, a lot of information material for each FTA, especially for the newer FTAs and also our delegations abroad. Um, we have staff, more than 200 staff um, of DigiTrade works in delegations outside the EU. And 44 of these also have a separate distinct trade section. And these people, they are very um, intensely, I would say, involved in events and also outreach uh, with uh, importers, uh, potential importers of EU products, but also uh, the host country itself, they are organizing events together. And uh, one of these will take place this week. Uh, it's about a Singapore FTA. So just to give you an example, but, um, but this is what we do. Um, obviously, um, we also have meetings with uh, civil society and uh, we have meetings with businesses upon request. And we're trying to also work with uh, the Enterprise Europe Network. Um, to uh, reach um, out to consultants, to uh, consortia who carry this network, and to help us promote FTA benefits. Thank you. Thank you, Mrs. Amberger. And this is a very impressive list of action. A second question now for Walter de Costa. Walter, are there only any other studies about the role that LSPs can play? And did it? Did they had the same results as yours? <laughs> well, um, there were quite a few studies in, in the past few years about the utilization of free trade agreements as such. Um, and in some of those studies, indeed, the question was asked whether LSPs do play an important role uh, or can play a role in the utilization. Um, and indeed, I mentioned myself that in, in a previous study that we did, we found that 80% of the companies that use an LSP did not know whether they use free trade agreements. Um, a study in Sweden did not find any correlation between the use of custom brokers and awareness about free trade agreements. And it was interesting there and even a, a bad, <laughs> something rather negative to see is that about a quarter of those companies that were lacking awareness said that this was because actually they were using uh, a custom broker. And a survey of the, of the Swiss government, if I remember well, which was focusing on importers, but still similarly showed that, that exporters who do custom procedures themselves tend to be better informed about the conditions that must be met to, to use free trade agreements than importers that actually rely on, on LSPs for this. Um, so, well, based on these studies, working with LSPs does not seem to have a major impact on, on a better utilization of, of free trade agreements, not among exporters, not among importers. But it's important to note that all of this is, is indirect evidence. 
to, to our knowledge, this is the first study of its kind where we actually did ask uh, LSPs themselves about how they see their role. But however, I think it's clear that still there's much room for improvements and that this could and, and should be made. And I'm, I'm very happy that, that Forward Belgium and Logistics in, in Bologna uh, participated to, to this study and it shows their, their eager interest to at least in Belgium to, uh, to improve things. Thank you, Walter. And indeed, a very interesting study. Thank you for, for this. It's now time to stop right here. I thank you all for your, part for your participation and presence at our webinar today and wish you a pleasant reading of the study. Have a good day. Bye.